Welcome! Today, we're diving into a biomechanical study that really challenges a common habit in the OR, a piece of dogma we might not even think about. We're going to see how a screw that intuitively seems like the right choice might actually be setting our fixation up for failure. So here's our game plan for this explainer. We'll start with a quick refresher on why locking plates are great in bad bone. Then we'll tackle that common assumption about screw choice. We'll get into the nitty gritty of how they tested it, look at the pretty shocking results, and then, most importantly, understand why it failed. And we'll wrap up with what this all means for our practice. Okay, let's jump right in by setting the stage. We need to talk about locking plates because they've really been a game changer for treating fractures in our osteoporotic patients. Right, so as you know, the old conventional plates worked by friction. You had to compress that plate onto the bone, which demanded good bone stock, and aimed for primary bone healing. But locking plates? They're a whole different animal. The screws actually lock into the plate, creating this single, rigid, fixed-angle construct. It doesn't rely on that plate-to-bone compression, which lets us be much more biological and encourages that secondary healing with a nice callus, exactly what you want in weak osteoporotic bone. So this technology brings us to a choice we make all the time in the OR, an intuitive choice, really. And that's exactly what this study decided to put under the microscope. So you're scrubbed in, dealing with some really soft metaphyseal bone. Your gut tells you to grab the screw on the right, right? The locking sponges screw. I mean, look at it. It's got a bigger diameter, a much more aggressive, wide space thread. It just looks like it's gonna get a better bite in that poor quality cancellous bone than the standard screw on the left. That's the assumption anyway. But what if our intuition is dead wrong? This study asks a pretty provocative question. What if that spongiest screw, far from being better, actually has a built-in failure mechanism that makes it weaker and drastically increases the risk of pullout? So how in the world do you test something like that? Well, the researchers came up with a really elegant and rigorous methodology, and understanding their setup is really key to seeing why the conclusions are so powerful. So they took the two screws we just looked at, and instead of using cadaver bone, which can be super variable, they used these validated polyurethane foam blocks. Think of them as perfect, consistent bone models. The PCF-15 simulates your standard osteoporotic cancellous bone, and the PCF-10, well, that represents the really, really poor, severely osteoporotic stuff. And here's what the actual test construct looked like. They'd fix a locking plate to the bone model using just one of the test screws. Then they attach this custom pulling rig to the plate to make sure that the force they applied was a pure, straight, axial pullout. No funny business. Each one of these little constructs was then mounted into this universal testing machine. Basically, it's a hyper-accurate distraction device. It pulls up on the plate at a very slow, constant speed, and it measures the force needed to do that. The number they were looking for was the peak force, in newtons, right? At the moment of catastrophic failure, the moment the screw ripped out of the block. Okay, so get ready for this. The results they got from this very controlled test weren't just statistically significant. They were, well, they were jaw-dropping, and honestly, a little bit scary. In that really, really bad bone model, the severely osteoporotic one, the standard locking screw was almost 400% stronger than the locking sponges screw. Let that sink in. That's not a small difference. That's a whole different universe of fixation strength. And it wasn't a fluke. Even in the slightly better but still osteoporotic bone model, the standard screw was still over 200% stronger. In both tests, the difference was, you know, massively statistically significant. And the raw data really tells the story. In the PCF-15 model, the standard screws held on with an average of over 600 newtons of force. The sponges screws, just 294. And it gets even worse in the severe PCF-10 model. The standard screw held to 167 newtons, while the sponges screw gave out at a pretty pathetic 43 newtons. The consistency here is just undeniable. So, the huge question is why? Why would this happen? And the explanation is just brilliant. It's not about the bone quality itself. It's about a fundamental, and as it turns out, catastrophic design flaw in that spongiest screw. This slide tells you everything you need to know. Look closely. Screw A, the standard one, has body threads with a one millimeter pitch. Now the threads on its head are a double lead design, which means for every full rotation, the head also advances one millimeter. The head and the body are in perfect sync. Now look at screw B, the spongiest one. Its body has that aggressive three millimeter pitch, but its head has a simple single lead 0.8 millimeter pitch. They are totally, fundamentally mismatched. And that is exactly what we mean by a thread pitch mismatch. Put simply, 
The distance the body of the screw wants to travel through the bone with each turn is completely different from the distance the head of the screw is allowed to travel once it engages the threads in the plate. So let's break down exactly what's happening when you're putting this screw in. As you drive it, the body is cutting a nice 3 mm path through the bone. But the second the head threads engage the plate, the whole system slams on the brakes. The advance is throttled down to just 0.8 mm per turn, but the body still wants to go 3 mm. So for every final turn you make to lock it down, that 2.2 mm difference forces the body threads to tear up and strip out the very bone purchase they just created. The authors themselves put it perfectly. During that final critical locking phase, the screw basically just destroys its own fixation. It turns a threaded hole into a stripped out smooth one. So what does all this biomechanical data mean for us when we're scrubbed in, trying to fix a tough fracture and some really compromised bone? The clinical takeaway here is just unambiguous. Our intuition is wrong. A bigger thread diameter means absolutely nothing if the basic mechanics are flawed. These specific single lead locking spongia screws fail and they fail catastrophically because of that thread pitch mismatch. And the worst part is, this design weakness is most pronounced in the exact situation they were supposedly designed for, weak bone. And that really leaves us with a critical question we have to carry into our next case. Are we just reaching for implants based on assumptions and what looks right, or do we actually understand the biomechanical principles behind the hardware we're choosing for our patients? It's definitely some food for thought.